Well, that was fun. A lot more fun than the market today. We had a stock slipping just a bit. But over the last five trading sessions, most everything is actually up except for the VIX, which has retreated. Where is this market headed next? David Bonson, founder and CIO of the Bonson Group of Hightower Advisors, joins us now. So I got to ask you first about Amazon Whole Foods. Deal closing, big news today. Do you care? I don't care. I, 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 I care in a big sense uh, going forward about the impact on all aspects of the economy that Amazon and its incredibly innovative and obviously disruptive presence represents. It's a particular transaction we didn't own either name. Years ago we owned Whole Foods. It was a dividend grower, which is what we do. Mm -hmm. But obviously this combined ecosystem of a company is the furthest thing from a dividend uh, payer, let alone a dividend grower. So it's not the type of thing that we would touch. And we actually have a really contrarian view on Amazon. We think it has unbelievable political risk going forward, which is one of the categories nobody's talking about whatsoever. Um, so wh what do you think the political risk is there? I mean, we see Donald Trump tweeting yeah, about and, and, it every and now that's, and then. That's probably what most people would think, I mean, but it yeah, actually what isn't. Do you mean? Um, I think that you have had most of the very hip, very cool, and obviously very successful technology-oriented companies get kind of a free ride for some time, and I, I think they deserve it. They're doing mm -hmm. incredible things to the economy. I'm not wishing for this to be the case. But I think that energy sector and financial sector has been a very easy target for the political left for a long time. And I just think at some point when they actually look at really where some of the impact on jobs and wages and things like that come from, um, to me, I just don't believe that they're going to sit still much longer. I can see Amazon running into some uh, headwinds, similar that Microsoft ran into with antitrust right. 20 years ago. I see a different era coming. All right, so you bring up politics, got us thinking about Washington. Obviously, we've had a lot of noise out of uh, Washington, D.C. recently. We've also had these geopolitical concerns kind of uh, swirling uh, not that long ago. We were talking about North Korea mm -hmm. every day. Uh, recently, it's been tax reform uh, mm -hmm. just this week that people got excited about that it was actually going to happen. Mm -hmm. And you seem to think it's going to happen, right? I'm very confident that it will. I couldn't, nor could anybody else, place the exact timing and the exact uh, mechanism, the, the way in which it's going to go about. I'm, I'm formulating better theories each day. Mm -hmm. I see a path to how I think they're going to go about doing it through reconciliation. It's the really key part. Obviously, this is going to have to happen with 51 votes. They're not going to get 60. There's not going to be any sense of this being a bipartisan effort. And so the 1986 tax reform was just categorically different. It took a lot longer, but it was true bipartisan reform and therefore had a lot longer process. This particular case, we more or less know the um, basics, mm -hmm. but then in the particulars, we're learning a little more each day. But I uh, very much believe that Secretary Mnuchin and Gary Cohn have teed this up significantly better than the uh, attempt at repeal Obamacare. What's and you on? actually think that um, there is room in this market for a little bit of a boost, a bigger gain yeah. once we get tax reform? Because there's some people that think, hey, look, after the election, in. we already right. got a, a lot of this yeah. out of our system. Yeah, and that's a, that's a fair thing to believe until you look at the data. And we look at a basket of stocks that are heavily beneficiaries of repatriation. They're significantly underperforming the market. So give me some names of those that you well, think. Well, would it, it, you, re, the, the names with large multinational um, exposure mm -hmm. and the names that have high tax rates, corporate tax rates. So there are some names that have very low effective tax rates because they're the beneficiaries of a lot of the deductions and and depreciations and different things of that nature. But right now there um, are in kind of non-tradable indices available that we monitor that sort of give us an indication. And and I don't believe that tax reform is fully priced out. Mm -hmm. I just think that it's somewhere in between. So that if it doesn't happen, stocks can drop. And if it does happen, stocks can advance. But I would be very selective. I think the stocks that will advance the most will be the ones that benefit from the way in which corporate income tax is re, uh, redone. All right, so let's get your bread and butter and talk a little bit about some dividend mm -hmm. uh, stocks and what you're looking at in terms of growing yielders. You're saying not, not high yielders. What does that mean? Well, it's an, a very important distinction. High yielding stocks generally become high yielding stocks because their stock prices went down so much. It has nothing to do with the dividend itself growing. It had to do with the denominator dropping, which creates a higher uh, uh, mm -hmm. yield percentage. What we like are companies that are growing that dividend year over year. Now, unfortunately, they call those the aristocrats 
oftentimes they can be very low yielders when you're purchasing them now because the market has a very effective way of pricing in mm -hmm. how those stocks are going to grow. So like 3M is a great example. We don't own it and we never have, but I believe they've grown the dividend every year for almost 100 years. And Scotch tape continues to sell and mm -hmm. post-it notes and <laughs> things like that. But um, that is sort of a clockwork like dividend growth and so p the stock market prices that in. We like to start with a little higher dividend yield. So we look at like an AT&T, you look at Merck. Um, uh, there, are, there are names that we believe are consistent growers but have an above market dividend to start. And for the life of me, I can't understand why that would not be a more attractive place to be with the anxieties that people have in this particular market. And is this a purely U.S. story and you're looking at just U.S. equities? Because a recurring thing right now really has been this idea that we're seeing global growth for the first time in a number of years be coordinated. Right. So if that's the case, how does that make you think about different geographies? So it's a wonderful question and it's one we're kind of working through because frankly we're bottom up uh, investors but we have to use a top down and macro understanding to make Make our decisions. Um, I have been in business for 20 years and the Nikkei right now today is where it was when I entered the business 20 years ago. Not a dollar has been made and we think there are some bottom-up stories in Japan that we're taking a good look at but we would look at them as dividend growers not to kind of buy Japan but to buy companies growing that free cash flow. Um, Europe has been less attractive to us and and uh, admittedly their macro story has gotten a little bit better. They're mm -hmm. still just uh, such an a, a issue out there as to when Draghi begins some form of tightening into mm -hmm. what, what that does. But um, the real way to play the global economy is still in the U.S. You have an incredible multinational presence with U.S.-based companies. All right, uh, David Bonson, thank you so much. Uh, your turn. Do you have a favorite Taylor Swift song? Um, my favorite Taylor Swift song is whatever my daughter is listening to. <laughs> On repeat, right? Yeah, yeah over most definitely. Over and over and over again. Right. All right, thanks so much. Good to see you.